Hey everyone, welcome back to our 2023 webinar series. My name's Emmanuel, I'm a dentist here in Sydney. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, my name is Emmanuel, I'm a dentist here in Sydney. Um, and today I'm hosting the, the webinar. I'm joined by Dr. Damien Tao, who's a dentist based out of Melbourne. Um, he's now kind of focused on the area of uh, sleep medicine, sleep disorder breathing, bruxism, TMD. So he's got a, a specialist TMJ clinic that really just deals with, with that area. And that's what he's here to speak to us about. Um, so this is part two of a little mini series he, he's done for us. Today, we're focusing on grinding TMD and splints, which is his area of expertise. So yeah, I can't wait to, to hear from Damien. And um, there'll be time at the end for questions. So if you have any questions you want to post in the, the comment section um, mm -hmm. or the chat, we'll, we'll get to it and answer all of those at the end. I think the format for today, it's going to be about 45 minutes. Um, so Damien will speak to us first. And then, like I said, we can answer any questions for you. Um, if you miss part one, there is a recording on our YouTube channel, which is General Dental, General Dental Residency, GDR. So if you miss part one, which was on more airway and sleep disorder breathing, um, you can watch the the recording um tonight will also be recorded though i'm not sure how long if those are going to stay up on on youtube so you might want to watch it soon um yeah without further ado i'll let damien take over no worries thanks for the introduction emmanuel i'll just go to share my screen there we go and stream yard Give it, give it that. Whoops. Okay, so thank you for the great introduction, Emmanuel. So tonight, everyone, I'm going to be doing a talk about bruxism and TMD. Uh, so as Emmanuel said, for those of you who don't know me or missed out on part one lecture where um, part one I spoke about t um, about sleep apnea and snoring, um, I specialize in TMD and sleep apnea, and I've been treating TMD and sleep apnea for the last 10 years. And um, I now work in a, in a, sleep, vic, a sleep clinic in, <coughs> called London Sleep Victoria in Melbourne, in Nidri and Footscray. And I also work in a TMJ, a specialist TMJ um, physiotherapy clinic in Caulfield North, where there's a team of TMJ physiotherapists and osteopaths who I uh, who work with me in the same clinic. And um, at, this is where I do most of my TMD work in the Lung and Sleep Victoria is where I do most of my sleep apnea work. So in Lung and Sleep Victoria, I do about 80% sleep apnea, 20% TMD. And in um, the TMJ center, I do 8% TMD, 20% sleep apnea. So all my clinics, I do exactly the same. I have the exact same format. So I don't, as you can see, these aren't the dental clinics I work in. I work, this is my room in Footscray. It's just got a bed, um, my laptop scanner, and I just bring a few dental tools. Um, this is the, um, the um, physio clinic, um, the physio bed, and the same tools as well. So I love showing this slide to everyone um, as a starting slide because it goes to show that what we're looking at here with TMD or sleep apnea or bruxism is we're not but they, they cause dental problems, which we see and experience, but reality is we don't need dentistry to treat it. Dentistry does help to treat it, and we do use dental devices such as splints to treat it, but reality is we're treating medical conditions and um, conditions affecting the whole body. So that's one of the um, pitfalls lots of dentists fall into when they look into TMD and sleep apnea and bruxism. We just think teeth, we think dentistry, we think splints, we forget to think this is a condition affecting the whole body. And last in the um, part one, I was talking a lot about how definitely that affects the whole body. But with TMD and bruxism, we're, we as dentists, we get 
we fall into this bottleneck of just a tunnel vision of just thinking it's all just right with jaw pain and the joint. And we forget to realize that it can affect the whole body. So <clears throat> the reality of treating TMD and sleep or in this lecture tonight, TMD and bruxism is it does not involve just making a splint. Most of these patients we will see will have other health issues impacting their presentation. And we are treating chronic medical conditions with dental devices such as a splint. So we have to have a holistic medical mindset and think outside of just dentistry and splints. And this is the reason why. So this is from Dr. Uh, Professor Jeff Okerson. Okerson is the head of um, the, the dean of TMD, no, the dean of orofacial pain. So not TMD, but the dean of orofacial pain for University of Kentucky. And Okerson runs a TMD and sleep mini, um, mini residency every year. And I attended his one um, 10 years ago. And you can see everything in this slide is everything we will see, which is pain related, orofacial pain related, which could be TMD. So if you look over here, there's actually no, in all these boxes, there's nothing which says TMD. Um, there's TMJ pain, there's muscle pain, there's myospasm, myofascial pain, um, arteritis pain, tension type headaches, migraines, neuromas, etc., terigeminal neuralgias. So we can see these are all the pains we will see, which we all classify as TMD. But reality is TMD is not the diagnosis. It's just another umbrella term, but the more better umbrella term would be orofacial pain. And then it's trying to determine what is the, um, the, the proper diagnosis of what this orofacial pain my patient is presenting it with. And everything we've got here on the left are access one physical problems that we can see. So the patient will point to their jaw and feel like I've got pain right here in my masseter and that we know that there'll be um, muscle pain. But there's also access to psychological conditions, which we also have to take account for. People can have psycho lots of patients with TMD and bruxism are stress heads. They've got high stress levels or they're anxious or depressed or there's something going on in their life which is causing them to clench and grind their teeth or affecting their sleep or affecting their stress levels, which then causes um, more, more um, somatic or neuropathic pain. And com by combining the axis one and axis two conditions, then we get the diagnosis. And only by getting the diagnosis can we then de decide on what treatment we can do. So the most important service we can provide is establishing the proper diagnosis, not establishing the treatment. That's the mistake all of us make. We see patient come in with TMD or bruxism, and we just say, Let's, here's the treatment. TMD, bruxism, it's always a splint. We don't know what the, what the diagnosis is. A splint won't help with neuralgia in all cases. A splint won't help with all muscle tension type headache cases. So we need to first get the diagnosis, then get the treatment plan, and then we can determine what our treatment would be, whether we'll be using splints or doing referrals to other people who can also help with this sort of orofacial pain. So when we see pain presentation in the clinic, these are different pains we can see. Um, we'll see infections like abscesses, broken teeth, trauma, such as avulsions, um, or wear and tear from bruxism. And these are normally pretty simple to manage, to diagnose and treatment plan because they're mechanical problems. We see abscess, we see um, a cracked tooth. We know, oh, easy. I just need to do a root canal extraction, the filling, done. The treatment, the diagnosis is easy. The treatment is easy. But with craniofacial pain, it is not that easy. As I just showed with that slide previously, we need to get this diagnosis. And the diagnosis of craniofacial pain is not that easy. It's not just a cracked tooth. It's not just an abscess. It's not just um, pulpitis. It could be a combination of any of these sort of conditions. And only by getting the proper diagnosis will we then be able to then determine what the treatment plan is. And a splint would be the most that we can do as a dentist, but Splints won't fix everything, which is why it's very important to work with a team um, with all these craniofacial pain patients. <clears throat> so Oakson says that the number one reason for misdiagnosis is just look at where the pain presents and not where the source of pain is. So if the patient is complaining of pain in the TMJ. It doesn't always mean the source of the pains come from the TMJ. It could be coming from their neck. It could be coming from their lateral pterygoid. It could be coming from their masseters or temporalis or their suprahyoid. So we need to figure out what the diagnosis or the source of the pain is before we start any treatment. So let's try to keep things super simple. This is what I teach to all my residencies and my residents who do my residency. I teach them that I show that slide, which overwhelms them, but then 
break it down, make it much more simpler to them. Because we're dentists, um, and most of you won't do the sort of work that I do. Like you do, t- you do your general dentistry, and you do the occasional TMD case. Um, and if you're only doing like one or two TMD cases a year, it's but very most likely you will forget things because you're not doing it often. Whereas in my situation, I do it every day. So I remember so many things easily. But if I were, if you then asked me to do a root canal, I've already forgotten how to do root canal for a lot of patients <laughs> because I haven't done it in many years. So I'd like to keep things super simple. So when you do get that TMD case, it will be very easy to um, diagnose and recognize what's going on. So we're going to simplify this sort of um, diagram into the biopsychosocial model. So the bio the biopsychosocial model is how we look at all pain conditions, not just TMD or craniofacial pain, but chronic pain, such as chronic neck or back pain or chronic leg pain, etc. They all TMD and orofacial pain falls within the biopsychosocial model. So biological factors are things that we can see, such as the, um, the jaw pain or broken tooth. Social and environmental and psychological factors are things that we don't see reg- as often. And we can only see these social, um, psychosocial issues if we ask the proper questions. So those are things like asking about their social life, their working life, their f- how things are going at home, etc. And as a dentist, these are things we don't think about asking or looking into all the time, which is why it's important we have to keep this mindset. And as you can see, just by Thinking about the biopsychosocial model, it's already making us see and treat the patient as a human being. We're just we're getting out of a dental mindset of out of our teeth and splints. We're now looking at the patient as a human being with real world problems affecting them. So <clears throat> let's simplify simplify the axis one, axis two biopsychosocial model. So for those who didn't catch it, axis one is bio the biological problems. Axis two is the psychosocial problems. So Let's say a patient comes in with um, a toothache um, and, we- and they've got this toothache going on and this is acute pain. So when it's in an acute setting, um, acute is this green area, you will see if it's very early in time uh, where we catch it, there'll be more biological problems and less psychosocial problems. Now, let's say this toothache gets undiagnosed or the patient doesn't come in for six months. Now, it's become the time is increasing, it's becoming more and more chronic. And when we get to this chronic state here, you can see the model changes. There is definitely a biological problem, such as a broken tooth or abscess. But since it's been going on for six months, the access to issues are now taking over and becoming more of a priority. Because if the patient has an abscess for six months, they're going to probably stop eating on the side of the abscess. They're going to stop enjoying the foods they used to enjoy. So if they enjoy eating pizza, they probably can't eat it properly anymore because it hurts them and they bite on it. They may um, avoid going out and having dinner with friends or going out to parties because they know whenever they go out, their tooth hurts and it gets embarrassing or it hurts to drink or eat. So they'll become more socially withdrawn or become more self-conscious about what they do. Just all the, And these are all psychological, psychosocial impacts, which is start affecting their brain and their mind, which can then start causing different pain messages to their body. So yes, we could then remove the abscess and remove the do the exo or endo and get rid of the biological problem. But the psychosocial problem will still be lingering and can still cause the same craniofacial pain in the body. And that's a, and this is how TMD works. Let's say a patient has pain in the TMJ and um, from falling over and knocking their jaw. That's an acute situation. They do nothing about it for six months. The pain, the pain of the jaw gets worse. They get more clicking and cracking and locking. But now the psychosocial issue has also become worse as well. Uh, just like that previous example with the abscess, um, they will find it's hard to open a mouth. They will be well, they'll avoid eating certain foods. They'll avoid going out and socializing. So that's going to um, impact the psychosocial state because they're now changing their habits to accommodate for their pain behavior. So let's say um, a patient comes in and the jaw starts, and they say that jaw starts ever, ever since I started Invisalign or ever since I had a filling done. What's your first thought process? My first, first thought process will be where is the source of this pain coming from? Is it coming from the muscles or the joints or the brain? And when I say the brain, I'm talking about more neurological, neuropathic issues, such as neuralgias or neuropathic pain, where it's referred from, um, psychos- um, from central sensitization. So this is this is um, this is how you simplify that craniofacial pain model from Erickson. Just always think of these three things: is the pain come from the muscles, the joints, or their brain? 
Now, this is how we then get our diagnosis. So if it's um, the sort, when we talk about muscles, muscles are either myalgia or myofascial pain. Myalgia is um, localized muscle pain. Myofascial pain is where it's um, pain in the muscles referring to other areas. Joint pain is um, called intracapsular problems, so pains in the TMJ disc joint itself. Now, brain issues, are, as I said, is more excuse me, more neurological, neuralgia, neuropathic, or psychological, psychosocial issues causing their um, central sensitization. And often it can be just one of these problems, like just a muscle problem or just a joint problem or just a psychological problem, or it can be a combination of these three problems. So TMD does not mean the source of pain is from the TMJ. The TMJs themselves only account for about 20% of craniofacial pain sources. So most pain in the head and neck area actually comes from the muscles. At least 50% of cases complaining of TMD is coming from muscle pain, most commonly from the masseters or the lateral or medial pterygoids or the temporalis. And it's normally due to this muscle splinting. Muscle splinting is also called protective co-contractions. So muscle splinting is a fancy term for clenching and grinding. <clears throat> so let's look into the different signs and symptoms we can see for joint uh, intracapsular pain or muscle pain. So when we're looking at um, intracapsular problems, well, these are the patients with have disc displacements or crepitus or clicking or locking. So they'll be complaining of clicking or locking or you'll feel clicking or locking or crepitus when you palpate their TMJs. And normally, uh, intracapsular problem, the pain is sharp and acute because if it's in the joint, when the joint clicks and locks, it'll cause a sharp, acute, short-lasting pain. It's normally local in the ear or TMJ area and won't be going anywhere else. And normally, you can feel the pain on palpation or function only because it's normally a localized inflammation. So these would be patients who say they don't have pain at rest or when you're talking to them, they have no pain. But when they chew or clench or eat, that's when they have pain. So there's generally no pain at rest or during the day. It's only when they're using their jaw to do something. Um, they may also have ear symptoms such as tinnitus or ringing the ears, a blocked ear sensation or hearing loss. Now, muscle pain, as I mentioned before, there's myalgia and myofascial pain. And myofascial pain is normally characterized by trigger points, which is where pain refers from another area. So you can have a trigger point in your SCM, your neck muscle, which can refer to your TMJ um, or to your masseter. So that's what myofascial pain is. Now, with myofascial muscle pain, it's more difficult to localize. With intracapsid, it was easy to localize. It's normally around the TMJ and the ear. Muscle pain tends to refer or spread everywhere. And sometimes on one day, it may be on the left side. The other day, it may be on the right side. Sometimes it may be in the temple. Sometimes it may be in the cheek. Sometimes it may be in the back of the neck. The pain could be behind the eyes or um, in the shoulders, arms, or wrists. Because if they're clenching and grinding, it can also use their neck and shoulder muscles when they're clenching and grinding, cause neck and shoulder pain, which can also then cause headaches and pain behind the eyes. They could have nausea, difficulty swallowing, or tightness in the throat. Because it's in, since they're using their neck and throat muscles, these muscles get tighter, which makes it difficult to swallow, causes nausea, and this can cause a tight or um, globus sensation where they feel something is stuck in their throat. So why do some people develop TMD or these pain conditions and some don't? This is all due to adaptability. So this is why we can see some patients who will complain of TMD, but then the TMD goes away by itself before we even do any treatment. And then there'll be other patients who the TMD is there all the time, and then it goes away when we treat it. But then um, six months later, it comes back again. And even though the splint is still perfect, it hasn't broken or anything, the pain has come back. And it's all due to how their body adapts. So everyone, every human has a biological system that can tolerate a certain degree of variation from the ideal. So this is how we can people see people with malocclusions or stress um, that will not always lead to TMD. And our dental treatments, such as splints, they may not always put things back to normal. Um, so our treatment success is related to how well the person can adapt to changes, whether it be negative changes, such as jaw pain, or even positive changes, such as putting a splint in the mouth to take pressure off their jaw joints. So 
The TMJ is a joint. We always have to think orthopedically, just like if we were thinking of an elbow or a shoulder or a knee. And orthopedics is the branch of medicine concerned with acute, chronic, traumatic, and overuse injuries and other disorders of the musculoskeletal system. So most TMD patients are having these sort of problems, having acute, chronic, traumatic, and overuse of the TMJ and the muscles surrounding the TMJ. Now, when joints begin to degenerate or break, um, jo uh, with joints, they can have um, biomechanical instability. And this is when the joints can begin to degenerate or break down when the destructive processes are exceeding the reparative processes. So this is where adaptability comes into play. If we have very poor ability to adapt, we will have more destructive catabolic processes. We have a uh, very young and healthy and can adapt and repair easily. We'll be able to repair and heal ourselves from the pain. So the result of these different processes of catabolic or anabolic processes will cause joint instability, which can then cause musculoskeletal pain. <clears throat> So let's look into how joints work. Let's say um, our TMJ is undergoing mechanical stress from clenching and grinding. These are some of the adaptive things that can, adaptive, um, adaptive processes we have in our bodies, our age. Obviously, the younger we are, the quicker it is to, and easier it is to heal. The older we are, the longer it takes to heal, or we have a lesser ability to heal. Our sympathetic tone. So sympathetic tone is our fight flight response. If we're in a chronic fight flight response and have a high sympathetic tone, we're going to be very high fight flight. It means the alarm bells in our brain are going haywire and we're not in a rest, restful, restful state. We're always trying to fight and run away from a lion. So having a high sympathetic tone is not good. We always have to have a low sympathetic tone. Who has high sympathetic tones? These are our stress heads, our people with anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Coincidentally, these are also people with lots of clenching, grinding, TMD, and bruxism. So our hormones, hormone levels can also influence our ability to, to adapt and heal. Any previous injuries, if it's I've got a previous jaw injury from knocking my face or clenching and grinding or um, having my mouth open for too long doing a root canal, these are all factors which can influence whether we are going to adapt or have a maladaptive response. So here's the TMJ and condyle. Um, it's always going through, let's say it's in normal joint loading, no wear and no um, bruxism, no wear and tear. So we're going to have this functional remodeling and adaptive capacity is very high. And we've also got articular cartilage, which is the disc, which is supporting the TMJ. Now, let's say uh, mechanical, mechanical factors come into play. We start clenching and grinding, with, uh, or we have a blow to the face or whiplash injury. We've got this parafunction or functional overload or um, increased joint friction. What's going to happen? Now we're going to have abnormal cartilage. We're going to have this dysfunctional remodeling. And when that happens, start going through this um, maladaptive change where there's hypoxia because now there's inflammation building up in this area. We all know what inflammation is. Inflammation increases blood flow to the area to try, um, which increases the uh, um, substance P and cytokines, etc. And in doing so, it creates more hypoxia. So when there's hypoxia, there's less oxygen. There's less oxygen in the area. It's going to be much harder to heal the area. So when there's, it becomes harder to heal, we start seeing joint and cartilage breakdown. We start seeing um, wear and tear on the condyles, on the on the OPGs. We start feeling crepitus and clean and locking in their TMJs. So this is the mechanical cas cascade, inflammatory cascade we see. You get this mechanical stress from clenching and grinding, which then causes hypoxia and, um, and reperfusion and all these free radicals, which then just decrease the oxygenation and ability for the TMJ and, and the disc to heal. We get this tissue destruction and impaired lubrication. And that's when we start seeing wear and tear, crepitus, locking discs, um, TMJ pain, and then and, and then muscle pain um, in relation with it because now the TMJ can't move properly. So this is what happens at the start. We have a very normal TMJ. Then over time, it goes through this adaptive mal this maladaptive change and starts getting this clicking and partial disc displacement. Then over time, the clicking may go away, but now the patient can't open the mouth anymore because what's happened, the click went away because the disc is now completely dislocated. It's complete displacement or closed lock where the mouth is shut closed. And then over time, they get impingement of the retrodiscal tissue. The retrodiscal tissue is behind the disc. 
The retrodiscal tissue is filled with nerves and blood vessels. If you're compressing the retrodiscal tissue, it will cause pain. The condyle should be compressing the disc. The disc has, is made of cartilage. It is the shock absorber. It has no nerves or blood vessels. So when you compress the disc, it has normal function and normal, um, normal joint compression. If you're now not compressing the disc and you get this disc displacement, you're compressing the retrodiscal tissue, you'll have jaw pain, um, jaw pain and inflammation in the TMJ. And here's a um, here's an MRI cadaver example showing a displaced disc. So you can see here's a disc in front of the condyle, and this is all the retrodiscal tissue. And when the patient opens the mouth and moves the jaw forward, you can see the disc pops back on and slips back on. So this is what TMJ clicking is. It's when the disc is slipping off then on the joint again. And here's it is on the MRI. So here's a condyle. This is the ear, and here's the disc in front of the TMJ uh, in front of the condyle. This is when the mouth is closed. When the mouth opens, the condyle comes forward and disc pops back onto place when the mouth opens. So our goal of TMD management shouldn't be to make a splint. Our goal is to create a favorable environment for healing and adaptation. So we want to create an environment where that TMJ can heal, where the hypoxia can go away, and where the inflammation can subside. And splints can help with a heal, create a healing environment, but splints don't always create a healing environment, which is why splints aren't always the answer for TMD and bruxism. So let's break down this adaptability a bit more. So let's say we've got this, um, we've got this flow chart. They've got a normal masticatory system where they're just chewing, eating, talking is normal. And we can have any of these different etiological factors which um, can cause a problem. They could have occlusal factors such as a bite change from a high crown or high filling. We have trauma from a blow to the face. We have emotional stress, such as a divorce or uh, um, something going on at work. We have deep pain input, which is where this deep pain comes from somewhere else. Uh, or they could have parafunction from clenching and grinding. All these etiological factors could cause TMD. We have our ability to adapt, such as our genetics, our biology, our hormones, our age, our um, diet, etc. And this will, and our adaptability, if we have very good adaptability, will be unaffected and we'll be able to deal with these etiological factors which um, could cause TMD. So these are all those etiological factors I mentioned, genetics, our ability to resist things, diet, hormones, our quality of sleep, which is why the sleep apnea and sleep quality is so important. Physical conditioning, how much we exercise, um, how, whether we're overweight or not, our age, our sex, where we live, general health behaviors, whether we're having a healthy diet and drinking properly, et cetera. So all those factors will affect it. So let's say um, this patient starts um, starts um, has has a change. So they start having in um, they have start having Invisalign or braces, and this causes an occlusal change. This causes an occlusal change, which could potentially cause TMD. And their ability to adapt will either make them have TMD or not have TMD. And then that and they may not have TMD from just having a occlusal change from um, Invisalign or braces or a new filling, etc. But then let's throw in other things. Let's say they had a new filling and then they start having stress from a new job and then they start clenching and grinding. Now we're throwing in more etiological factors, which is bombarding their adaptability and that could worsen their, um, their ability to adapt and cause TMD, or they may still be able to adapt and deal with the, these different stresses and not have TMD. Let's say the adaptability changes even further. Now they're getting more stress at work. Their diet changes. They're getting older. We're always getting older, which can make, um, make it harder to heal. Um, let's say we get an injury as well in um, playing tennis. All this is now going to make it more harder for the body to adapt. It's going to increase our stress on the body to heal and remodel itself. So this will then gradually lead to more chronic changes. And that's when we'll start affecting the central nervous system. And we start seeing changes in how our hype, um, hyper, um, hyper, hyper, uh, HPA axis works, our descending inhibitory system. This is when we start seeing these crazy TMD patients. These are ones where they're saying the pain is everywhere. We can't localize it. They're having signs of neuralgia and other things going on. And this is when they're in the chronic state. And these are patients I see every day. These are the patients that most of you probably never want to treat because you're just, I don't know what to do. This is a crazy patient. Um, and this is with these patients, you need a team approach. A splint is no longer going to help their problem by itself anymore because there's so many chronic changes affecting both physically, biologically, but also centrally, psychosocially in their brain. 
So let's go back to our example. We're getting all, um, they've had a high crown or in, um, Invisalign or something that's causing changes. I mean, they're having stress, a new job, parafunction. Um, it's causing TMD. They're no longer able to adapt. They're no longer being unaffected. And as time goes on, goes from acute to chronic, we start getting more chronic pain conditions. I start having fibromyalgia, sleep disturbances. The central nervous system is becoming affected. So these just affect changing. These etiological factors will no longer work anymore. So let's say it was a high crown. We removed the high crown. It's no longer a collisal factor. We remove, we address our power function. We address the stress at work. But that may not be enough. They might still have pain because now the central nervous system has also changed. They're in this state of um, high sympathetic tone and central sensitization. So we need to try to quiet down the nervous system as well as work with the etiological factors going on. And that is basically what I see on a regular basis with the chronic TMDs. So if we can get them acute, when it's mostly um, just within six months at the start, it's normally a lot more easier to treat. Um, but it becomes more chronic. They've been having it for months or years. It's going to be much more hard to treat. And a simple splint normally isn't the answer. <clears throat> Now let's go into bruxism, and this is a key thing. When if I see patients with TMD, majority of them have some degree of day or night bruxism. So with bruxism, we can have awake or sleep bruxism, and they're both very different entities, um, which can make it very confusing for dentists because we all just think bruxism is just one thing. We don't realize there's two entities, and the management and manifestations of them are both very different. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine defined sleep bruxism as a sleep-related movement disorder in 2005. This is almost 15, this is more than 15 years ago now. I, graduate, I started dentistry, my first year of dentistry was in 2008. Um, and when I was in university, this definition was already out in 2005. And I never came across this definition in my five years of uni. I graduated 2012, um, started working in 2013. Only when I started working in 2013 and started doing residency in sleep medicine did I then see this definition of bruxism. So this is a big problem. We're not being taught in dentistry that sleep bruxism is a sleep-related movement disorder. It is similar to insomnia. It is similar to REM behavior disorder. It is similar to sleep epilepsy. Before 2005, Sleep bruxism was classified as a parasomnia, an undesirable behavior during sleep. So the sleep doctors, they've known that sleep bruxism is a sleep condition for since to, before 2005. But us as dentists aren't being taught this. We're not realizing this. And the, um, to look into bruxism, we have to look to things called sleep arousals. So I talked about arousals a bit in the part one lecture, but arousals is... Um, a brief awakening, anything that wakes us up during night. And an arousal is normally associated with a bruxism event. When we do a sleep study or a PSG, which is a sleep study, we look at arousals. And normally when we see an arousal, we would see there's clenching and grinding going on at the same time as an arousal. So um, in essence, sleep bruxism is not a dental condition. It is a symptom of a sleep-related movement disorder. And most of us dentists, we don't recognize sleep bruxism as a sleep medical condition. And we just, we treat it incorrectly. We see, oh, bruxism, let's put a splint in the mouth. A splint isn't going to help sleep apnea. A mandibular vasal splint probably will, but a Michigan splint won't. A, sleep, uh, a splint won't help insomnia. A splint won't help restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome and insomnia are two of the biggest sleep disorders which are associated with bruxism. You pour splint in the mouth or insomniac, it's not going to stop their bruxing. They're still going to have insomnia. You have to treat the insomnia, which will help treat their bruxism. The splint is just a crutch to help protect their teeth and maybe take pressure off their TMJs and their muscles. So this is what I was talking about. We have two types of sleep bruxism. We have primary sleep bruxism, which is idiopathic, where we can't find a cause of it. Then there's secondary bruxism, which is associated with medical conditions such as insomnia, such as sleep apnea, such as restless leg syndrome, such as sleep reflux. So we have to always look for the secondary bruxism. If we can find the medical condition causing the bruxism, our treatment should be aimed at going towards that medical condition. A splint isn't going to treat that medical condition. The only medical condition a splint can treat is probably TMD or chronic craniofacial pain or sleep apnea if we make a mandibular advancement splint. <clears throat> 
Now, this is from Professor Daniel Manfredini. Manfredini is one of the most leading, world leading experts in TMD, sleep bruxism, and sleep apnea. And this is one of his studies um, that he up, he has a Facebook group, and he uploaded this in September last year. And you can see sleep bruxism can occur alone or with comorbidities such as OSA, reflux, insomnia, headaches, orofacial pain. So headaches and orofacial pain is our TMD periodic limb movement, rapid eye movement disorders, and sleep epilepsy. So these are the conditions we should be looking for. Whenever we see a sleep bruxa, don't just think splints. Think, what is the diagnosis? It goes back to what I was talking about at the start. Bruxism is not a diagnosis. It is a sign or symptom of something else going on. We need to find that diagnosis. Then we can do the treatment, whether it be a splint or referring to a sleep doctor or ENT, etc. <clears throat> so this other study, for, again, it's got um, um, some experts on bruxism, such as Prof. Lobazu and Jill Levine. They say that we should recognize that most risk, risk factors for sleep bruxism, such as stress, smoking, caffeine, alcohol, and TMD, or chronic facial pain, are known as risk factors of sleep disturbance and sleep disorders. So basically... If you're too stressed or you're a big smoker or you have lots of caffeine or alcohol or you have TMD, these factors can disturb your sleep. If they're disturbing your sleep, it can cause you to clench and grind your teeth. And then that will then manifest as cranial facial pain, such as TMD. So you can see it all just goes hand in hand. It's all this cycle and cascade, which all works together. So... Whatever, you always consider jaw bracing and clenching and grinding whenever you're looking at TMD or bruxism. So we all have heard of clenching and grinding. Most of you may have never, ever heard of the term jaw bracing. And that's because it's a term that wasn't taught to us in dentistry. Jaw bracing is when we're tensing the jaw muscles without touching the teeth, without causing any teeth damage or wear and tear. And this is why we would see many clenches and grinders who have no wear and tear. There will be no attrition, no abfraction, but they're clenching, grinding their teeth. And uh, you were looking at them and say, oh, shit, there's no, there's no wear and tear. I guess they don't need a splint. It must be crazy. And believe, um, um, they must be thinking that they're clenching, grinding, but they're not. So this is, from, um, this is from a lecture from Dr. Anna Colonna. She's an orthodontist from Italy. And um, she did a lecture on awake bruxism. And on one of her slides, she mentioned that um, the awake clenching seems to be associated with psychosocial factors and number of psychopathological symptoms, while there's no evidence to relate sleep bruxism with psychosocial disorders. So what we're realizing is most people with awake bruxism are clenching their teeth and is normally or bracing their jaw, and it's normally related with psychosocial issues such as stress or depression or anxiety. Now, this study is from January 2023, so just three months ago. And again, it's got these experts, got Jill Levine, uh, not Jill, um, Daniel Manfredini and Anna Colonna again. They found that patients with TMD have a significantly higher frequency of awake bruxism. And most of those awake bruxism they found was manifested as mandible bracing. So they weren't clenching or grinding their teeth. They were bracing their jaw muscle and tensing it without causing wear and tear of the teeth. So what they did in their study, they used an app called the Brux app. And what the Brux app does is um, the patients have to go into the app every hour and they record what they are doing with their jaw. So they record whether they're clenching, grinding, bracing, or their jaw is relaxed. So over here, these are the different readings. About 54.4% of people were bracing their jaw. 13.6% um, of them were clenching their teeth. 29.1% uh, were bracing or clenching their teeth with teeth contact. 1.9% of them had a relaxed jaw. And then 1% were grinding their teeth. So the awake bruxism, most people with awake bruxism are bracing or clenching their teeth. They're not grinding, and you won't see wear and tear. What you will see is linear alba, scalloping of the tongue. You'll see soft tissue trauma from the clenching or the bracing. You won't see hard tissue trauma on the teeth. You'll see soft tissue trauma. So this is Daniel Manfredini, one of his lectures I attended last year as well. He was talking about this mandible bracing and awake bruxism, and this is what you will see. This sign of linear alba 
is not just cheek biting, it's a sign of emotional overload. The patient is undergoing lots of psychosocial stress and bracing and tensing and clenching their jaw, which is then causing this linear alba, which is then potentially causing TMD. <clears throat> So how I manage bruxism is I followed a multiple P approach. And this is also how I manage TMD. I look into these five things. I look into doing a pep talk or counseling. So especially since a lot of these patients have psychosocial issues, we need to talk to them and educate them about what their problem is, how we're going to treat it, what it will involve. Um, the psychological factors, I don't do the psychological therapy, but I know people, I refer to hypnotherapists and like psychologists to help with the um, psychological therapy. Physiotherapy or my um, physiotherapy or osteopaths or chiropractors. I work with a team of physios, osteos, and chiropractors who are specialized in TMD, and I refer to them regularly. I the only thing we mostly do is plates or oral appliances. And sometimes I may prescribe pills or drugs such as muscle relaxants or anti-inflammatories to help with their pain. So the pep talk part is where we can play, and um, the patients can play an active role in their care and management of their bruxism. So there's this. Um, term that Oakson uses called physical self-regulation, where it's explaining the concepts of bruxism to the patient. Explain to them that it's a sleep, there's a sleep disorder. It can be related with airway, our stress, our posture, um, our sleep hygiene, reducing alcohol, smoking, al um, caffeine, etc. So all this sort of education makes such, um, it's all helping the patient heal themselves and also improving their adaptability to heal themselves. If they're going to reduce their stress, if they're going to reduce their caffeine, reduce their smoking, the body's going to be able to heal better and easier and faster. So find a psychologist who manages Bruxism. This is feedback from my, my psychologist who saw two of my TMD patients. She said, um, on, with this first patient, um, the popping, clenching, and growing had reduced by 50% just from two sessions. The second patient was a stress teacher. And um, she said within two sessions, the, this patient, um, she found a rib which had been pop, um, locked out of place, popped back in by itself um, uh, for the first time in two years. Um, and she was reaching new levels of relaxation she had never reached before. She was still bracing, but she was getting better with it. And she was having positive thoughts um, for the first time in 20 years. So these are all the things we can't treat, but we can recognize and refer our patients to help get the proper care they need. Because if this person is having negative thoughts for 20 years every time they go to work, no splint is going to help stop their clenching and grinding. They're going to keep breaking the splint I make because they're always having a shit day at work. So we need to find these, recognize these factors and also find people we can refer to to work with. So the Brux app is something I use with all my patients. So it's an app you can get patients to download on their phone and it sends reminders every hour asking what they're doing with their jaw. It's by having a constant reminder will help patients become more aware of what they're doing and train them to stop clenching and grinding. I used to tell my patients to just sigh and just go, just breathe in and out to relax their body and relax their jaw during the day. Just bring all this awareness of what they're doing can make a huge change and reduce their clenching grinding. And I've had some patients, the pain goes away or reduces just because they're no longer clenching and they're becoming more aware of what they're doing. There's this other app I use as well called No Clenching. So sometimes you use No Clenching or Bruxap, um, whichever is easier because the Bruxap does cost about $3. So some patients want to save money and they use the No Clenching app, which is, does the same thing. I teach my patients um, not my functional therapy. I teach them how to breathe properly. The big three is how we keep the jaw relaxed. You'll be surprised when you teach the big three to your clenchers and grinders, a lot of them will say, oh my God, I've never felt my jaw feel like this before. My jaw feels relaxed. They will not know what a relaxed jaw feels like because they're always bracing and clenching their jaw muscles. It's the same if I have sore shoulders because I'm always raising them up. My physio will need to teach me to relax my shoulders. It doesn't matter how much massage I have on my shoulders. They're always going to be sore and hurting unless I relax them. As the same with the TMJ and the muscles. We need to relax them and the teeth should never touch. Teeth only touch when we're eating or chewing. And that's what the apps, these no clenching and Brax apps show. They say the teeth should never touch during the day. Most patients think our teeth have to be touching 24 7. So the pep talk, that's what I go through the Brax app, awareness, big free. Um, I go through hypnotherapy, physio, osteo, chiropractors, splints, different pills or drugs that I prescribe. There's a different myofunctional exercise I teach for my patients. The myofunctional exercise are tongue and lip exercise to help them relax the jaw and keep their jaw neutral so they're not tensing it. 
Um, <clears throat> Mariano Raccobardo is a TMJ physio from, um, from Chile who lectures about TMD physiotherapy. Um, he has his set of exercises called the Rock Bar 6x6 exercises. I, um, people can just Google it to find his exercise, and it's very it takes about 5, 10 minutes to do. Um, pills, different drugs are sometimes things that I might prescribe. I don't use a first-line approach, but sometimes I prescribe anti-inflammatories or muscle relaxants to help the patient reduce their pain a bit while they're going through all these different therapies. So muscle relaxants, I sometimes prescribe Norflex, um, which is a muscle relaxant, um, or sometimes Valium. I rarely do Valium because it makes people very groggy and a risk of addiction. So I normally do Norflex, but sometimes Valium works better. Um, find a competent physio, chiropractor, osteopath you can refer to. 90, 95% of my TMD patients, I'm referring to some sort of body person. I don't just refer to people I work with in Caulfield. I refer to people outside my clinics because I have people come all across um, Melbourne to come see me. They're from countryside, the west, the east, the north. So I refer to patients in all sort of areas. So splints, this is basically what we could be doing as treatment. Splints, the, we always have to think before we start making splint, the body does not require acrylic for proper function. Appliances just help the body to heal itself. It just helps the body get to that adaptation. Now, these are the different, um, different um, reasons that splints could work. We actually don't know how splints work. So these are the eight reasons that Okerson found in his um, research. He found that splints could help by altering the occlusal condition, could help with altering the condyle position, could be increasing the vertical dimension, could increase cognitive awareness of their clenching and grinding, could change the peripheral input to the CNS, could change, it could help with muscle, um, uh, with muscle recovery. It could just be a placebo effect or it could be a regression to the mean where the pain was really bad, but it just helps get it back to a lower level. So with splints, we're actually not sure how they work, but in some situations when in, um, what, when there's a displaced disc with cl um, clicking or locking, that will compress that retrodiscal tissue of that vascular bed and reduce the blood flow. A splint can help by relieving and decompressing the TMJ and the disc to allow proper blood flow and regeneration. So it's helping to improve that adaptability of the TMJ to heal and remodel itself. So our goal of TMD management isn't just to make splints, it's to help create a favorable environment for the patient to heal. A splint can help the TMJ heal, but we just have to look into all those other stress, psychosocial, biological factors at the same time. So that's basically all I'm going to be talking about tonight. Thank you all for your time. Um, if you'd like, I do have a, um, a, a Facebook um, TMJ sleep study group. More than welcome to join it. Um, I post regular cases and, um, and research about TMD and sleep. Also, feel free to email me if you have any questions or cases you ever want to discuss. I'm always happy to help out because TMD and sleep is a very difficult field that lots of us aren't trained in or don't want to do, want to treat. So if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to me through Facebook or email. All right. So I'll just... Thank you so much, Damien. That was fantastic. No worries. Thank you, Emmanuel. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If anyone has any questions, we'll be here for a few more minutes. So feel free to post the questions um, in the, the comment or the, the chats. Um, and hopefully Damien can, can answer them. I, I have a question, actually. I was wondering about there's so many different types of splints that, that we see, you know, prescribed for, you know, more your idiopathic TMD type patients. There's hard, soft, flat plane, Michigan, Gelb appliances. You can do them for the maxilla or the mandible. Um, there's mm. the deprogramming ones. Do you have a general go-to or it really depends on the, the patient? Is there a way you decide that? Mm. It really depends on the patient and the diagnosis. So I have like, I use um, all those splints you mentioned are different splints I use, and it really depends on what the presentation is. So no one patient will get the same splint, but I, I generally use four or five different splints, which are my go-to splints. Um, but knowing which, what, which patient falls into one of those five splints really depends on what the diagnosis and presentation is. So for example, like, uh, most of our patients, most, the most common TMD problem we will see is myalgia or muscle pain from the masseters or temporalis from bruxism. 
Most of those can be managed with some sort of flat plane splint like a Michigan um, or an anti-OD programmer like an NTI or a, a full coverage anti-OD programmer. So those are most of the um, most common splints I make for most people. But when it's getting more complicated where there's more jaw locking or crepitus or clicking, that's where a flat plane or D programmer may not work so much. Um, and some people will have both. They may um, they have both crepitus with muscle problems and then it becomes more complicated. But, oh, which do I use or do I have to use yeah, this? Exactly. Yeah, some pages that go through. Some of my pages that go through a, a combination of different splints. I might start with a, a anti D programmer, then later go to a gold splint, or use both at the same time. One during the day, one at night, or um, for a few months, I use this splint. Then a few months later, they change to a different splint because as things heal, then the treatment will change over time. Um, it's just the same with any other medical problem. If I'm having shoulder problems, um, and then my physio does all the these work on this part, then it gets better. They won't keep doing the same treatment. They'll start working, but if my shoulder is still sore, they'll start doing other things um, to help with the treatment. So the treatment will gradually change um, and when we're seeing these patients as they're healing and getting better. Yeah, okay. And then, um, I mean, do you have a preference with, what about material? I know now, I think we've discussed before that maybe there's you know, newer materials where the thickness of the splints can be a lot thinner because they're mm. like these 3D printed nylon materials. Is that kind of your your preference over acrylic? Um, mm. Yeah, definitely. So I've been using 3D printed nylon for like eight years now, um, and it's my go-to material. I, I'm not pretty much... 90 to 95 percent of my patients are all in nylon splints um i rarely use acrylic the only the times i use acrylic would be if patients are using something during the day and they don't want to it to be too noticeable they want to clear and see through um but these i don't normally use acrylic because um one it's uh weaker um it's very brittle breaks easily um two it can be much thicker as well so especially with some tmd case, cases if it's too much um, acrylic or material in the mouth becomes um, more uncomfortable and they're already in discomfort and pain. And then we're also thinking about sleep apnea in the airway as well, because sometimes they might have sleep apnea with their TMD and we're using acrylic, which is a lot thicker. Um, it can also block their airway or um, block the tongue space. So it becomes harder to breathe um, or just harder to keep their tongue in their mouth properly without blocking her throat so that's why i always tend to use nylon because it's a lot thinner and stronger um and it in terms of adjusting it's very it's just the same as using acrylic you just need to have the same burrs the downside of nylon is you can't it's difficult you can't really add acrylic to it so if you need to build things up or things like that you can't really add to it so those are cases where i'm thinking we we might need to add um acrylic to it at some stage, I would make it as an acrylic splint and then add acrylic when I need to um, at the time. Yeah, I, thanks for that. I, I appreciate that. I think you told me about these 3D printed nylon splints um, mm. maybe even o over a year ago, and, and I'm certainly using them now. And a lot of my patients who had previous like thick, soft acrylic splints made mm. and you know, came in and, and by another dentist and, and, and said they could never tolerate the splints and so they don't yeah. want another one and I kind of mm. sway them into let's try this one and they, yeah. they all find it tolerable, which is, is really nice. Um, we do mm. have a, a question from Ben who also says mm -hmm. thanks for the great lecture, so we appreciate that. He wants to know if there's any place for Botox in TMD um, mm, yeah. or, or laser as well maybe oh yeah it's definitely that. so yeah. I, um let's talk about botox first um yeah. so i i don't i rarely i don't do botox myself i do refer for it but very rarely because botox is just like splints as well it's um just another sort of band-aid or stopgap or crutch to help reduce some of the symptoms um, for a few months. But then normally once the Botox wears off, the pain will probably still be there uh, or come back because um, Botox is just basically working for muscular myofascial myalgia pains. Uh, but I've seen lots of patients who've had Botox where it didn't actually, it didn't work. They had Botox and did nothing. It's still having the pain because they have too much um, central sensitization or the pain, 
just it's not just pain here, but it's pain in other areas as well. Um, or the pain was here, but I was referring from the neck or the shoulders caught into the masseter. So Botox is never my first line um, modality. I rarely refer for it, and I normally referring for it after I've tried other things or I'm using it in combination with other treatments such as a physio or splints, um, etc. And normally, if patients um, have muscular problems, um, I, I'm more so referring for to physio or osteochiropractors to work on these muscles, which is normally more effective than Botox because they're not just going to work on this muscle. They will look at the other things going on and say, oh, yeah, this muscle is hurting because you've got poor neck posture or you're using your neck muscles or shoulder muscles or it's not just from here but it's just here as well so i normally find the um, proper physio chiro osteo is much more effective than botox it's coming it's becoming more holistic and look at other factors that um the these physios cars or osteos are more trained in than we are because they know this anatomy a lot more better than we do as dentists um, now, laser is another therapy that I refer to and have and use a lot, um, and I find it much more effective than Botox. But again, laser is another adjunct therapy. So laser, it's not laser for cutting or burning. They're lasers with just shining light. Um, I actually have, well, I have my laser next to me here. This is my home, uh, my laser oh, I use. Yeah. Um, and basically, <laughs> Yeah, I can actually show it. This is pretty cool. I can show everyone. <laughs> but basically what it does, it just shines um, a red light um, and and basically it just shines this red light and you can just you know hold on to muscles and what laser therapy does is um it redu reduces inflammation in areas so it can help reduce inflammation in muscles and joints so it's not just for tmj but can, uh, they use it for like legs and elbows and shoulders um so i refer to a gp in melbourne who specializes in lasers and she does lasers for the whole body so sometimes i have patients with tmd pain but they always have lower back pain or hip pain and they'll be doing laser on that area as well as the tmjs so it's another adjunct treatment which does help a lot with um when it's combined with like physio and um or chiro et cetera, and splints uh, but yeah i um that's basically um different modalities i use in combination with splints or without splints mm. Yeah, and are these are these like um, laser or, or Botox therapies? Would that be more indicated in more acute cases, like more more acute TMD or, or muscular um, type cases, rather than the the chronic TMD cases you often get referred? Both. Yeah, it can be both. So um, laser, both. especially, it helps healing and regeneration of um, nerves, bone, um, blood vessels, and muscle, etc. So it can be laser can be used effectively in both acute and chronic cases. Um, so in acute cases, obviously, it will work a lot more effectively and faster. And in acute cases, normally acute cases, you won't need to do as much different therapy. So acute cases, you might just need to do one therapy, which is maybe just splints or just physio or just laser. When it's more chronic cases, that's where you need to throw a combination of therapies such as splints and physio and laser and drugs and sleeping properly and et cetera. <laughs> so, um, these all these treatments will be splints, physio, Botox, etc. Um, they can be used for both chronic and acute. It's just that with acute, you may you won't have to use as many treatments. With chronic, that's when you have to be throwing in more and more different treatments at the same time. Okay, that makes sense. I think I have one more question before we go from Sarah, um, mm -hmm. who had a patient who developed a methacrylate allergy um mm. so so to the the medication and, and she was wondering what might be an alternative um to to that medication where, where indicated i don't know if you're thinking um valium or ibuprofen or what do, do you have a, a preference yeah. if uh, me methacrylate drugs aren't an option i think it's more methacrylate for the acrylic um yeah for the um the material oh, of the acrylic. Sense. that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that um, makes yeah so reading a question, uh, read, I can see the question here. Um, so the patient had a mass, and I'm assuming it was an acrylic mass, but developed an allergy to the acrylic. So definitely a 3D printed <laughs> nylon is what I would use um, for right. that patient because, um, well, very rarely. Um, exactly. he, yeah, I've had some patients be allergic to nylon, but very, very rare. I have maybe, and I do maybe 500 splints a year. So um, I have maybe three or four patients a year who will be allergic to nylon. It's very rare, but um, it's much 
much lower allergy rate to nylon compared to acrylic. Um, so for your patients, Sarah, I would be looking to 3D print it nylon. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Awesome. Thank you so much, Damien. I think that wraps it all up today. Um, if anyone found, you know, this in part one interesting and wants to learn more about these topics, Damien actually runs a TMD and sleep mini residency. Um, so you can search Damien Tiao and TMD and sleep residency to, to find out more. I definitely think that's going to be really one of the emerging areas for, for us general dentists um, in, in the future. And this stuff is such a practice builder. I was discussing with Damien before we came on that, you know, I, I look in the patient's mouth and you would see the attrition, anterior attrition and the linear alba or the scallop tongue or all the, these other sides, maybe they're signs, maybe they have a tendency to mouth breathing. And you would start kind of telling them about their their habits and, and what you think. And they're amazed that, you know, you know all these things about them by just looking in their mouth. Um, and often it's never been mentioned to them before. And those then become like lifetime patients because they're, they're really impressed. And on, on top of that, you're really doing them a, a huge service um, as well by actually treating that condition properly. Um, so yeah, if you want to know more about that, please look into Damien's mini residency. Um, otherwise with GDR, for those who don't know, we run a comprehensive one year residency kind of on all things bread and butter dentistry. Um, so it's really aimed at recent graduates to give you the, the skills that maybe you didn't learn at university um, or at least re reinforce them and really good modules. I think there's now 18 modules. So there's, you know, information on communication, which is very important with patients. Um, things like veneers and crowns is in there. There's a photography module, um, a treatment planning module. We, we touch on orthodontics and implantology. Um, so a lot of really good stuff there. Um, also hook you up with a mentor that's in your area who can do regular check-ins with you and discuss treatment plans and, and organize Zoom, um, Zoom sessions every month. So if you're interested in that, you can look it up on any of our social media platforms or on our website. Um, otherwise, thank you again so much Dr. Damien, for that lecture. It's a pleasure. You're welcome. It. I'll end the broadcast here. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone.